Welcome to Wash to Shore and to Art 101 in Bandon, Oregon. And we have um, a wonderful audience here that's gathered to uh, hear Captain Charles Moore, who is a world authority on marine debris and the environment and has done has started an amazing uh, nonprofit organization called Algolita that has actually been my inspiration with the Wash to Shore project. Uh, when I first noticed and really thought about what was happening on the beaches, I, I, I didn't know what to do and I went to the web and I started typing in things like and there was all this information that came up and there was Captain Charles Moore and he was talking and I was like, oh my god, I gotta do something about this and this man inspired me and then I went to his website and then I did all this stuff and I thought, mm -hmm. you know, this is an amazing person and I've, you know, been lucky enough to, to meet him in the past with, uh, and had conversations with him about what we're doing and what he's doing and uh, when I heard he came out with this book, I said, uh, we need to have you come to Bandon and you need to uh, come here and do a book signing. We have volunteers that want to learn about this because everyone's attuned to it around here in Bandon. So um, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, have him come to Art 101, uh, where we house the Wash to Shore project. And this, this man has really changed a lot of people's lives in, in really spectacular ways. He has uh, certainly changed my life in uh, a most unexpected way. I'm now dedicated to this, this topic and I think a lot of my volunteers, it's changed, it's a wave and it's changing a lot of lives and making us all start to think about our plastic consumption and about uh, what we're doing in our lives and where we're going and how we use consumer goods and and how we look at the ocean. So this book that he has uh, written, he's going to talk about a little bit, but mostly he's here to really give us more information about something we all really deeply care about and probably all love because we all live near it here, and that's the ocean. And this is Captain Charles Moore. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for the great turnout tonight here in Bandon, Oregon. You uh, definitely uh, proved my point that it's the small local communities that are really making a difference, that are really interested in dealing with situations. That's where we're having the most traction with this message. And so I'm really glad to see you all here tonight. Now, what I want to talk about really is this seminal period in history that we find ourselves in. Uh, we've been at this project of civilization for a long time now and it's culminating in a situation in which the side effects of our progress are beginning to look like those drug commercials where you start adding up the side effects and the beneficial aspect of the drug appears to recede behind all the side effects that are negative to that drug. So you get the question, do we want to continue on this trajectory that we've been on, or do we really need to reevaluate the project of civilization? And I'm here to tell you that I think it's time that that reevaluation begin. I mean, uh, this book just came out, The Sea Can Wash Away All Evils. It's by a scholar of Greek classical literature. And in 413 B.C., uh, Euripides wrote a play called Iphigenia and Taurus. And this is the quote that uh, is the title of the book, The Sea Can Wash Away All Evils. This is where it comes from. This is our attitude toward the sea. Uh, you know, in historical times, people didn't control natural forces like we can today. And they felt subject to them. So they felt any problem that arose from natural sources was because they had sinned. It was because they had done something against the gods that controlled those natural forces. So their response was to engage in sacrifices, engage in gifts, engage in offerings. And this was the way that they sought to deal with their powerlessness vis-a-vis -vis nature herself. So th this is a, a passage in this play about some strangers that came that they wanted to use as an offering 
And they said, how shall we deal with the strangers? And Iphigenia says, uh, uh, I want, first says, I want to immerse them for the sake of holy purification. And Taos says, in the waters of springs or in the salty sea? And Iphigenia says, the sea can wash away all evils of humankind. Then Taos says, oh, then it might be more sacred then to the goddess. And Iphigenia says, I myself think it is better. So the idea is that the sea, as vast as it is, is it has this power to purify. Rivers can get dirty. Rivers can silt up. We see them getting dirty. We see them turning brown. But as they go out into the sea, they become blue again. They, the, the, the sea purifies. This idea that the sea can purify, that can take anything we can dish out, uh, that idea is beginning to be one of those other problems, these planetary systems that we're having this destructive relationship with, it's filling up. And that's what's washing us ashore. Now we've been giving to the sea for millennia something that it can't digest. And finally, there's visual evidence of the indigestibles coming back from the sea. The sea has had enough. It's now washing ashore those indigestibles. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight, this situation we find ourselves in in which uh, the sea has washed away all our evils but is now choking and giving them back. So let's take a look. I didn't discover the North Pacific subtropical gyre. When it says in the book that I'm the discoverer of the garbage patch, that's different than the North Pacific subtropical gyre, which the gyre, garbage patch is a part. Here you can see an image of uh, a pamphlet by the California Department of Fish and Game from 1960 on the migration of albacore. And if you look <coughs> right here where you are, you're sort of between the two current systems. The, the low pressure system here is counterclockwise. The high pressure system here is clockwise. And here, you see, occasionally things get spit out, make it through these two current systems and wind up on the beach here. That's why you see today was very clean down at Cape Blanco, but occasionally when Angela goes down there, she finds so much litter she can actually sweep it up with a broom and a dustpan. Uh, today we were picking up just little individual pieces. But occasionally that system of currents lets a little bit come out right in that crotch right there out to the coast between the two systems. In general, low pressure systems that go counterclockwise spit out trash and high pressure systems that go clockwise uh, converge the trash. So that is created, those currents are created by air. It's air pushing on water that makes currents, okay? That's what makes the ocean move. And uh, the air that's heated at the equator uh, creates a mountain of air on its way to the pole. And that H right here is the peak of a mountain of air. That's why it's a high pressure system. It's a high, it's actually high altitude system too. It's a, a mountain of air that's been heated at the equator as the new air rushes in at the equator, pushes it north and south. And the northern hemisphere descends in a clockwise movement, and that clockwise movement pushes on the surface of the ocean. That's what makes this gyre, this current system, and it's a six-year period of rotation around that oval. Here is uh, the way NOAA depicts it. The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration depicts it as this convergent zone here that uh, is fairly narrow, but this whole area is the North Pacific subtropical gyre, that whole clockwise system. It's all polluted with plastic and it has these two garbage patches. The western garbage patch, we have a team transiting at, as I speak right now, sampling every 50 miles through the western garbage patch on its way to Japan. And the eastern garbage patch, which I've studied, they're halfway between uh, here and uh, Honolulu. So this is the vessel uh, purposely built to do oceanographic research, not necessarily trash. I wasn't into trash when I built this boat. 
uh, mostly into bacteriological pollution, uh, nutrient pollution, uh, not so much solid waste like plastic. But the catamaran provides a very stable platform. Uh, it actually goes under that bridge where I dock it so it can have the mass tilt down and I go under a 12 foot bridge. And I've done these voyages in 1999, 2000, 2002, 2005, 2007, 2008, 2009. And this is the tool that we use to assess how much plastic is out in the ocean. You know what a manta ray is? A wide mouth ray that skims plankton out of the ocean uh, through a kind of a baleen like a whale has. Well, this is called a manta trawl. It's got a wide mouth, it's got a long net, it skims the surface of the ocean and collects the material that's on the surface in that bag at the end there. Now, uh, the ocean is still blue out in these garbage passes. You don't look at the horizon and see a trash island. This is not what you see. What's got me fired up, and the reason I'm upset is because even though you're looking at a clear blue ocean, you trawl that net through it, and this is what you get. This is the ocean. This is the plastic soup we're talking about. These are the particles. This is the stuff that you know I find on the beaches of Hawaii. For you folks over here that can't see, I'll, I'll put that back. But that's what our, our beaches are turning into. That stuff floats in the ocean. It floats and gets sieved out by beaches in the uh, Hawaiian archipelago and makes the sand. But now it's also appearing here in uh, Cape Blanco. We're seeing it, and we'll show pictures of that later. Uh, a lot of it are these pre-production plastic pellets. Uh, you can see them. Here's one right here. Let's see, right there. That's an oval pre-production plastic pellet. When they've been floating in the ocean for a while, they get orange like that one there. That's PCBs, DDE, uh, pollutants absorb up to a million times the level in seawater. Plastic's how you clean up an oil spill. You have the Exxon Valdez, the Deepwater Horizon, you see those booms? Those booms are expanded polypropylene, the same thing your bottle cap's made out of. Expanded ethylene, the same things your soap bottle's made out of. That's how you separate oil from water. You take plastic to separate oil from water. If you've got a recreational vessel or a, uh, a fishing vessel, in your bilge you may throw down a, a bilge pad. That pad is expanded polypropylene or expanded polyethylene. And it, what will do allow you to pump your bilge water over the side without creating a sheen on the surface of the water. It's illegal to pump out bilge water that leaves a sheen on the surface of the water from the oil. To separate the oil, you put a pad made out of plastic in your bilge water, sucks up the oil, then you can pump up your dirty bilge water overboard because it's not oily. Plastic sucks up oil. Pollutants are oily. A farmer doesn't want to have the pesticides wash off his plant. He has an oily medium for delivering that pesticide. That gets into the ocean, sticks to the plastic. The plastic accumulates it, makes poison pills for these creatures to eat. A lot of these fragments in that bag of sand I'm passing around have already passed through the bellies of uh, planktivores and small fish in the ocean. Uh, we take these samples we get from that trawl that come in that collection bag. Each one is labeled, taken to the lab. We carefully separate the plastic from the plankton. That takes about a week. It costs $500 to do one sample because we're carefully separating the plastic from the plankton. Then we size class it, which means we take some of those sieves like geologists use. They're Tyler sieves. They're round. They have different mesh sizes. You stack them up. You put the plastic in it, wash water through it, the little particles go through to the bottom, different sizes come up. So each one of these sizes is uh, a different millimeter size class. Four to two millimeters on the left, two to one millimeter is the most common one, then uh, three quarters to one millimeter, half to uh, three quarters, and a third of a millimeter is the smallest size class. And we often ask ourselves, why invariably is this smallest size class the least numerous? You take a cookie and crumble it up, you get a lot of cookie crumbs, all right? Mm -hmm. You take these plastics and crumble them up, you should be getting a lot of tiny particles. But those tiny particles are our least numerous. Something's going on there. 
Then we also take the trouble of separating them by type. We have the styrofoam is the smallest size. Now if you do, I was just speaking in uh, the Seattle area and in uh, Edmonds there was a volunteer citizen scientist that was uh, trawling a uh, manta trawl offshore in Puget Sound and his most common type of plastic was styrofoam. Now you can see the styrofoam over here in the window. Uh, styrofoam is made out of polystyrene. Polystyrene is heavier than seawater but if you inject air into it it floats but by injecting air into it you make these very skinny bladders around the air and they're easy to crack and they get into the marine environment they get waterlogged they break those membranes then the stuff starts to settle down so in the deep ocean we don't find a lot of micro particles of styrofoam uh, in the coastal ocean that's the most common type of plastic that you find but you can see in ours that's the least then comes the nurdles that's the stuff that's the raw material of the plastic industry the plastic resin beads are what is melted to make your plastic bags your soap bottles anything that's a thermoplastic a plastic that can be melted and remelted is coming to the factory in this form as these nurdles some of uh, the roto molders that make your kayaks things that are seamless like those big play habitats they have at McDonald's and stuff like that they're made in a, a, a mold that rotates and they grind up the nurdles and pour the powder in. it's like a waffle iron inside that melts the stuff to the edge and they make them uh, rotate in different angles and that's what will make things like your kayaks and stuff like that um, those uh, roto molders use a powdered pellet but it's still the form in which it's shipped from the factory that makes the pellets like Dow. Dow, BASF, the big companies make the pellets for the little guy who's called a converter or a processor. A converter takes the pellet and makes the thing, the Venetian blind, the bag, the bottle, whatever it is, that's a converter using those pellets. They spill them on the railroad tracks when they come in in the cars before they get up into the silo. They put a vacuum hose on them, suck them up into the silo that's leading down to the factory floor and when they break that connection to the rail car they spill on the railroad tracks, rains, blows into the storm drains. That's how they get into the ocean. We studied that in LA. Found out millions of them in the storm drain. Then the next category, the most common one that we find right here, that is thin plastic films. That's the thing like plastic packaging. That's your bags, your wrappers for your goods. 55% of the plastics are for packaging. That's what we use our plastic for mostly is use once and toss. Once you unwrap that thing, that package is a pain, right? I mean, <laughs> do you want to put it in your pocket and drag it around with you all day till you find a trash can? I mean, you tie it, tear that little Z, you know, that sawtooth edge off your power bar or your peanuts, you know, what are you supposed to do with it? You cut the little tag off your clothes after you shop, and where does the other end of that little tea tag go that has the label on it, you know, and the price tag? Uh, there's millions of these packaging items that are just fast track trash. So that is the most common type of pollutant that we find out there that we can identify. The rest is uh, fishing gear, uh, unraveled, and unidentified fragments. We're not sure where they come from. These are all the places where we've done that, where we put that net out in the ocean and pulled it and gotten a sample like this. This is a, a one mile zooplankton trawl out in the middle of the ocean. That's a jar like we would put the samples in and every dot on there is a place where we've done that. And we take it and analyze it. And one of the ways we can describe it to you is to make a bigger circle if we find more trash. So this uh, diagram here shows larger circles where there was more garbage. And when people say, well, the garbage patch is twice the size of Texas, I mean, no scientist would ever choose the state of Texas as a unit of measurement. <laughs> but, you know, if that's, the, if that's what you relate to as Texas, then there's Texas, okay, 
Yeah, I mean, maybe it's twice as big as Texas. Uh, here's another way to look at it. We just make the colors brighter when there's more plastic there. So the brighter red means it's a heavier concentration. Not that the rest of the ocean is plastic free. It's just that there's a heavier concentration there. And yeah, that's about twice the size of Texas. That's Dr. Ebesmeyer from Seattle's uh, assessment. And, you know, he's just trying to make it understandable. Now, we've done this uh, one specific area. If you go back here, you can see this one specific area right here, kind of a upside down V. Uh, that was where we went in 1999. That was our first assessment of this problem. That's where we found six times as much plastic as plankton. So we wanted to go back there a decade on and redo that area. And what we did, uh, we found most everything had gone up except in 2009 it was really rough out there and when there's breaking waves those small particles get driven down below where the net can catch them. So we didn't have as high a count of plastics but there's more big stuff out there now so the weight was still greater. Another way to look at it, uh, well, what I should say is that um, we want to let everybody have a chance to put their data in. We want to have uh, data from citizen scientists around the world. So we worked with Esri, the leader in GIS, Geographical Information Systems, and developed this system. So you can put in you know, the, the, the information and whenever you click on one of those points, it'll tell you who took the sample, what they found there. We want this for the entire world. This is our goal, is to get a handle on how much is out there. Why? Because if you don't know how much is out there, you don't know if all the stuff you're doing is doing any good. Angela wants to make a difference. I want to make a difference. A lot of people would like to see this plastic pollution go away. It's not, fishermen don't want to be chasing down balloons out there in the middle of the ocean, you know. Uh, catching uh, trash with their nets. Nobody really wants all this plastic pollution out there, but if we don't know how much is out there, we won't know if it's getting less by the stuff that we're trying to do. So we need to know how much is out there. We need to know how much is out there also to assess the, the, the seriousness of the problem. And uh, another way to look at it uh, in, in what we did in those that one little area that I said, 11 stations, 11 samples. We did in 99, we did it in 2008 in the wintertime, 2009 then in the summertime, uh, is with this kind of a graph. And it shows you that the plastic to plankton ratio was up 610%, you know. Uh, it shows you the plastic density went down 20% in 2009. That's the number of particles per square kilometer, per cubic kilometer, uh, per cubic meter. Uh, but that's, I say, related to the wind. Every other parameter went up. Everything else went up. Just the number of tiny particles, that's one of the reasons maybe we don't see as many of the tiny particles in that uh, last glass is because uh, any turbulence will make those tiny particles uh, part of the water. If I read a paper on the distribution of oil droplets by breaking waves and any oil droplet that was below 20 microns, which is a small oil droplet, it didn't act any different than the water. It didn't act buoyant. Even though it, you know, oil floats, it, if it gets tiny drop of oil, it stays with the slab of water that it's in and just moves around with the rest of the water. So you don't have a situation where little floating things want to float back up. They, the, the, the water acts really viscous to it, and it doesn't act like a floater. So more big stuff, more habitat, that's what we're going to talk about now. Yeah, when it's windy the little stuff goes down, but the weight still was greater. We still had more heavy stuff out there. We've got a lot of plastic floating out in the ocean that's increasing, so we've got a lot more habitat. Every piece of plastic uh, out there has a biome surrounding it, has a group of creatures living on it. This is what we're starting to find. Caulking tubes as habitat, you know. This is something you might use to cock your bathtub. That's a polychaete worm growing up uh, around the, right up there. Uh, there's fishes living in there. You know, this is like an oceanic trigger fish bed and breakfast. He's got uh, food growing on the walls, you know. It can hide from predators. Uh, 
I mean, uh, this guy is a happy camper in there, you know. <laughs> but that's nothing but a caulking tube. That's what that is. Uh, this guy, if you're a fisherman, you see a fish like this, it's like, I don't think I want to catch this fish. This fish looks sick, you know. This is not a sick fish. This is a fish that is so totally relaxed, so totally unworried about being eaten by a bigger fish, that it's just sunning himself on a piece of trash. And Angela has one of these in her display case. I don't know what they are. They're the lid of some kind of a container. But there's only a, like an inch of water over this fish. It's just, mm -hmm. But it's just sunning himself right there. It doesn't look like a fish. Any predator looking up at that sees a piece of trash. It doesn't see a fish. So this fish, is, they don't leave when you see them out. They may have grown up in this habitat. They don't, this is their sanctuary. You know, this affords protection because the fish can dodge a predator that's chasing them down. They can hide behind it and you know, play like hide and seek around a tree. Uh, here's uh, affordable housing for fish, you know. Uh, these are vegetarian fish, but they've got all they need to eat growing on the sides of this thing. We find fish that have grown up inside an oil bottle. You know how oil, that quart of oil has the narrow uh, thing so you can pour it in, uh, but a big body. Well, we found a trigger fish inside one of those that couldn't get out, that had ate all the algae enough to grow to maturity inside the oil bottle, then couldn't get out through the neck of it had to be slid open and let out. That's how they get enough food growing on the sides of these things so they can just stay there. Uh, talk about shooting fish in a barrel, you don't have to shoot them. Uh, they hide in the barrel and when you collect the barrel out of the ocean they don't want to leave, they stay right in there. So bring it up on deck, it's still full of fish. You can dump the fish out, there they are. You, know, uh, you get a nice uh, load of fish just collecting trash out of the ocean because the fish are hiding in the trash. They've grown up hiding in the trash. That's always been the place they've gone for sanctuary. That's where they go to hide from predators. So they don't run away. Now we're starting to see coral. Angela's got a piece here in her display cabinet she showed me that really impressed her because it had a piece of coral on it. We're seeing it more and more now. We're seeing creatures that live on the coral reef living out in the ocean. And it's rare that we find a trace back where a piece of trash came from but a Korean uh, broadcasting corporation group did a documentary on marine debris and they filmed me in Honolulu at the 5th International Marine Debris Conference then they went back and did some research sent me their finished product and when I played their DVD I, it blew me away because the most common float we find out there is this 300 millimeter black and the most uh, there it is there mixed with, in, with some other floats See this one right here? That's the one that's the most common float I find out there. And I never thought I'd know where it came from. This is the most common ball, uh, glass ball we find right here. That's a large glass ball. Well, it was like a revelation when I played this Korean documentary. This was a Korean beach. Oh I was like, wow, what is causing this? Well, you know, we pretty much fished out our wild stocks of fish and to get seafood now farmers are becoming the producers. The farmers of the sea rather than the fishermen are producing half of our seafood. These farmers, uh, this is their operation. This is in Korea. I just talked to some scientists that were on my boat doing some bird research that were over there researching in Korea. They say you drive along the coast in Korea you see this everywhere. All these inlets are completely mined with these buoys and aquaculture operations. What is the crop that these farmers of the sea are growing? Uh, they're growing a very popular uh, sushi restaurant commodity, the uni, the sea urchin. And there you can see their harvest. These are what they're growing. Uh, but there are international standards for proper aquaculture and mariculture that can certify different kinds of growers, but nowhere in their protocols is there a criteria for loss of equipment. They have bacterial contamination, they have chemical contamination, they have uh, disease problems dealt with. All these things they're thinking of, but they never think about polluting with plastic, about polluting with their gear, the loss of gear. If you have a terrestrial farmer and his irrigation pipes are 
clogging up the street downtown, somebody's going to scream, but nobody's screaming about the fact that all this mariculture and aquaculture operations are losing tons and tons of debris to the marine environment. So I want to make a big deal out of it because it's creating a new coral reef in the middle of the ocean. This coral is now attracting the fish that you would normally only see in coral reefs. This is just like a day's catch of what we find pulling stuff out of the ocean out there in one of these garbage patches. And here you can see in this crate, which is probably used to sort fish, coral. That's a coral head there, another coral head right there. So this is coral reef habitat. This is a Hawaiian sergeant living in this stuff. We find it out there. This is scrawl or scribble file fish found on tropical reefs to 120 meters. That's what it'll tell you in your field guide. You'll find this fish to 120 meters in coral reef habitat. Well, I found it in 3,000 meters out in the middle of the ocean because there's enough coral growing on the trash out there to be a coral reef. So we're finding the coral reef fish out there. Frog fish in the deep ocean? I mean, they do associate with debris, but now they have a lot of habitat out there. And they're a chameleon of the ocean. They're a lion weight predator that blends into their background. So they'll <coughs> sit by you know, a yellow net or a black net or a float and change their color. Then when another smaller fish swims by, they dart out and grab it. In the deep ocean, in a clean ocean, it's blue. You don't need to be a chameleon in the deep ocean. The typical colors in the deep ocean, like for these mahi mahi, is silver on the bottom. So you know, if you look up, it blends in with a sparkling surface and dark blue on the top so if you look down it blends into the deep blue you don't have these chameleons living in the deep ocean like you do now with all this trash and uh, these trigger fish can bite holes in the soap bottles and make it a habitat for these rudder fish out there there's the little guy that associates with debris he's pelagic but he's got really sharp teeth that can uh, do this kind of damage where you have a bottle like this just completely chewed up these really sharp little beaks on these trigger fish can chew this stuff up uh, Ziploc baggie has just the texture feel of a jellyfish is getting predated now uh, one of the things I'm most proud of that our foundation has done and, and the foundation I work with uh, uh, the Reed Foundation is to pay for the first postdoctoral scientist focused exclusively on marine debris at a major university, University of Hawaii at Hilo. Dr. Hank Carson uh, took up a position as a postdoctoral fellow to study marine debris. One of the things he did was get these samples out of the museum libraries of what an albatross beak bite looks like or what a parrotfish beat bike, you know, uh, looks like, and compare them to what he was finding on the beach. And he did this graph. He found bite mark distribution by size. Hank Carson, he went to Camilo Beach, where my necklace is from, where there's a lot of stuff that has these bite marks on it. And he analyzed these bite marks, and he found 33% of the things that he picked up off the beach, the bite mark was from carnivorous teleost. Translation, meat-eating bony fish. Teleos bony fish, carnivorous meat-eating. Chondrichthys is the sharks and rays. 36% look like they've been predated by shark or a ray. The herbivorous teleos, the vegetarian bony fish, 25%. Then you have the reptiles, which would be your turtles, uh, eating, taking the larger bite marks. And aves is birds. Uh, birds are down in the smaller sizes. So that's pretty high percentage of the stuff floating up there. That's why I'm saying when you look at uh, you know, these particles, uh, they've probably been through the belly of a fish already, uh, one of these, or a bird, or a reptile. This is the poster child for eating plastic uh, by mistake as food, the Laysan albatross. And I put this slide up because people don't realize how big these birds are. This is a four-month-old chick being held by this biologist, and the stomach on this chick is as big as her stomach. I mean, look, there's the stomach of this bird, there's her stomach. I mean, really, this is a big bird. 
So when I show you the stomach contents, now I'm going to show you the stomach contents of one of these baby birds, four months old. It's not because the baby bird has walked down to the beach and started picking stuff up off the beach. They hang by the nest and wait for mom to come back. Mom or dad is out there, you know, a happy meal for an albatross is not down to the corner of McDonald's. It's like 5,000 miles, okay? They're soaring with locked wings at night. They don't, uh, they sleep with one eye open, you know. These are crazy birds that are programmed to cover vast distances of ocean, and they're like the vultures of the ocean. They, they're picking up anything that looks like potential food and coming back and regurgitating it into the chick. The chick pecks on the beak of the parent bird, the parent bird goes up for you kids, it's like, you know, Mom, I'm hungry. Sure, honey, come here. <laughs> you know. Well, this is what Mom barfed up into that one chick. This is one chick's contents of their stomach. One baby bird. Very little natural detritus in here. Virtually all menes jar lids from Japan, the Kewpie menes, cigarette lighters, uh, spray foam, fishing floats, bottle caps. Bottle caps are a big problem. You know, I'm looking at the audience, I'm thinking a lot of you are old enough to remember when you pulled the top off a beer can and it came completely off. And we used to make the curtains out of them in the 60s, you know, uh, long of beer bottle caps. Now they don't come off when you pop the top. Well, the cap still comes off of the bottle, okay? The fact that the cap comes off the bottle, we think there ought to be a leash law. It ought to be stuck on the bottle. They should need to come up with a leash for it because when you look at these pictures of these birds, there's a lot of bottle caps in there. And they're the most common thing I see floating around out on the ocean, just standing on the bow looking over the side, seeing when I can identify something. The most common identifiable thing floating by is a bottle cap. As I said, plastic absorbs pollutants. Not only does it absorb pollutants, plastics never leave the factory without additives. Additives are not polymers that are permanent, that don't biodegrade. Additives are monomers that leach out. Your flame retardants, your UV stabilize, your colorants, your uh, softeners, your things that keep the plastic sheeting from sticking to itself called slip. All these additives leach out into whatever that plastic comes in contact with. So when it enters the ocean, all these materials are leaving the plastic as well as materials coming in. So it's a sponge for stuff, but it's also a source for stuff uh, coming off of it. It gets you coming and going. Now we've talked about floaters but you notice none of these bottles have caps on them. You take the bottle cap off one of those water bottles, those pet water bottles, it's a sinker. The polyethylene terephthalate is synonymous with Dacron polyester. Those of you boaters out there know your nylon ropes, your Dacron ropes, they'll sink. It's your polyethylene and polypropylene ropes that float. Well, the polypropylene bottle cap floats, but the polyethylene terephthalate bottle sinks. So here, 3,000 feet in the Mediterranean, they're filling up with bottles. Take a look. If you want, you know, Dr. Sylvia Earle's pushing deep sea submersibles as a way for people to see, you know, the real outer space, which is the bottom of the ocean. But if you take a trip uh, to the bottom of the ocean in the Med, this may be your scenic panorama. Uh, wherever there's a crevasse, instead of seeing sea life, you're going to see. Uh, bottles and bags, you know, this is the bottom of the med now. It's filling up with heavier than water plastic. It can't get out because it's just the Strait of the Gibraltar. It's just a little tiny place where stuff can leave the Mediterranean. So the bottom of the Mediterranean is full of plastic. Every little crevasse now has got plastic and they, there's currents at the bottom of the ocean just like the surface. They're just much slower. So these heavier than water things do move and get to these locations. Do you really want to be drinking water out of these pet bottles? Dr. Sachs doesn't think so. They leach stuff, folks. Uh, my colleague in uh, Germany, Jörg Ullmann, keeps a suite of very pure water 
snails in his lab. He decided to, t to split them into two groups and put uh, one of the snails as controls, leave them in the pure water. The second group he put in mineral water. The group that he put in the mineral water made twice as many eggs as the controls. That's what we're talking about here when we're saying leaching phthalates such as DEHP. This is additives such as plasticizers or catalysts migrate from plastic packaging into the food stuff. These substances act as functionally active estrogens in vitro on the human estrogen receptor alpha. In other words, you take one of our estrogen receptors out, put it in a Petri dish, pour some of this water on it, it, acts, it lights up. It's like saying, yeah, I, I, I hear you. You're, you're, you. you got some information for me. I'm ready to make a protein for you. Cause what he's saying, in vivo, in a molluscan model, that's the thing about these snails. You put these mollusks in the water that we're supposed to be thinking is more pure. It's not more pure. It's estrogenic. It has the potential to increase egg production in a mollusk. So bottled mineral water may therefore contribute to the overall exposure of humans with endocrine disruptors. Meaning what? Obesity, diabetes, lowered sperm counts, all these are effects of endocrine disruption. Now, here's a, I, I, I want to, the other quote that I want to give you. This is a whale, that's the only one we have left that learned how to eat mud, all right? Mm -hmm. And you think how gross, eating mud, all right? A coastal whale that eats mud is a very smart whale. He's almost, let me, I just want to read from Jack Rillo, this is a living doc, this is a guy down in the Gulf area that collects specimens for laboratories. He says, <clears throat> he I looked at the mud around my dock. It wasn't mud to me. It was a rich and living substance, the very essence of life itself. All those little pockmarks, casing, burrows, and trails, all those little jelly-like blobs were living creatures. I often wish that for just an instant I could see through the mud, that all of that opaque brown would suddenly turn crystal clear so I could really see the wealth of life that lay at my feet. Then I would be able to see the millions of clear-skinned, mud-dwelling sea squirts that uh, revealed their orange digestive organs and the white-shelled little clams and the gray thin-skinned sea cucumbers. I would be able to see at a glance the tens of thousands of long-legged brittle stars <laughs> sitting seven or eight inches down in the glassy substrate with their long, long spindly arms reaching up from their tiny, almost pinhead bodies. But maybe it was better that I couldn't, perhaps. It would be too much of a shock. There would be too much life to comprehend. There's 90, over 90% 90 of the biomass in the ocean is in the mud at the bottom of the ocean. This whale takes advantage of that. 50% of the resins we make sink in seawater before you even add any of those additives. This whale washed up on a West Seattle beach in 2010 with all these heavier than water plastics inside of it. A pair of sweatpants, golf ball, 20 plastic bags, small towels, duct tape, surgical gloves. We're going to start seeing these whales that we just got off the endangered species list, all right? We talked the Mexicans into not putting a salt plant into their calving lagoon down in San Ignacio Lagoon. We've taken these whales off the endangered species list. Are we going to have to put them back on because of bottled water? You know, this stuff is going to pollute their habitat. It's going to roll into this coastal zone where these guys are feeding. That's the way they feed. They, they lay on their side, they open their mouth, and they uh, kind of go an S-curve through the mud and swish that mud out through their teeth and keep anything solid in there. This was all solids that remained inside the whale. We're filling up these whales, not just this mud-eating whale, but we're filling up the, the plankton-eating whales and the, the krill-eating whales, too, with this crap. So this is a day sample. You can see there's no fish in there. Just a couple of insects, halibates, that's the little water striders. But this is a different world at night. The freaks come out at night in the ocean, all right? Uh, grazing happens during the day on land. Farmers don't expect to see a lot of activity in the pasture at night. But it's the total opposite in the ocean. The grazing in the ocean happens at night. All these little grazers, they would be consumed if they swam around during the day in the upper water. They have to hide below the what's called the photic zone, where light will penetrate in the ocean, maybe a mile deep in these oceanic deserts, these gyres. And at night, as soon as that sun sets, there's this 
largest daily migration of life on Earth comes up to the surface to graze on the phytoplankton that's been created by photosynthesis during the day. These are the grazers, all right? This is a night sample. These are the most common fish in the ocean. You've never ate a mctophid, a lantern fish, probably never seen a lantern fish, but they are 55% of fish biomass. That just shows you how big this habitat is out in the ocean. The, the average depth of the ocean is two miles. There's a huge volume of habitat. The biosphere is not really on the land. The, the stuff that lives in the air above us is not massive like it is in the ocean. The two miles is the average depth of the ocean. This huge habitat is populated by these mctophids. 55% of fish biomass is in this one genus of fish. The reason salmon leave and go out in the ocean is they want to eat these guys. This is what's out there for them. They get a lot better deal going out and foraging out in the ocean than they can near the coast. Mctophids are one of the main fish they eat. We got these 671 of them in our trawls in 2008 out there in the wintertime when they were actively breeding out there. This is what they're feeding. These are the, the grazers, okay? These amphipods and copepods, they're eating the stuff we can't see, these little tiny marine plants, the phytoplankton, that's called primary production. Then these mctophids are there to eat those grazers, that's their food, that's what makes them be such a successful fish out in the ocean. Well now we're finding 35 percent of these stomachs that we opened up, there was plastic in them. There's a little piece of plastic right over here. That's a piece of plastic. This is a piece of plastic. This is where you've got about as much plastic as natural food. And this is the record holder where there's 84 pieces of plastic. And the, these are fish about the size of your middle finger. You know, they're anchovies of the deep ocean. These are the bait fish, the feeder fish that live in the deep ocean. Okay, what are we doing to these fish now with our trash? We're feeding them something with no nutritional value. We're feeding them something that has pollutants stuck to it, that has got this lipophilic, oil-loving character about it so that it goes around in the ocean collecting pollutants that are oily, concentrating them up to a million times their level in the ambient seawater. So we're making these poison pills. So each one of these pieces of plastic is a poison pill with different levels of poison on it. So no food value, poison. But think about this third thing. This is a fish that has to migrate. Have you ever tried to dive in a swimming pool with a life jacket on? This is floaters. These are little life preservers inside this fish. We're not giving it the extra energy it needs to combat that extra flotation we're giving it. We're asking it to swim down below the photic zone full of plastic trash with no food value. This is the fish that's feeding all your tunas, all your swordfish, all your mahi-mahi, all your salmon. This is the feeder fish for the ocean. This fish Fitness is being compromised by our trash as it has broken down into these micro-sized particles. This is a serious issue for the world's food web, a very serious issue, and has not been explored. There has been, our, our results were repeated by Scripps, and they did find high levels of plastic in the mctophids they looked at. So no question these mctophids are eating them. No question that they're in all five of these garbage patches. The question is, how much longer can we feed them this and still have wild-caught salmon? That's the issue. I mean, it's killing not just fish, it's killing baby turtles. The turtles go to these garbage patches because they're oceanic deserts. There's not a lot of predation there. I, I don't catch big tunas, big swordfish, big marlin, big mahi-mahi in these garbage patches. Once in a while we'll catch a small skipjack, or a small mahi-mahi. That's all we catch fishing out in these garbage patches. Because of that, a baby turtle will go there, eat the little jellyfish, and grow to maturity without being consumed by another animal. So it's a place where baby turtles go to grow up. This baby turtle died with two of these little three millimeter particles blocking its pylorus. It couldn't eliminate. So we're threatening the survival of these 
animals that we go to so much trouble on land to protect their eggs, then we send them out to eat garbage and kill them because they can't digest their food. So we really have to talk about the fact that these microplastics are everywhere out in the ocean. Because the role of the infinitely small is infinitely large. That's what Louis Pasteur said, the founder of science of microbiology and the creator of vaccines to present diseases caused by germs. Remember, this one's always the smallest one right here. Well, also the different types. Here again, one of the inputs is the plastic from aquaculture. This is floats. Docks are supported by these styrofoam <laughs> floats that have little miniature beads of styrofoam loosely glued together without any covering over them. This is a, a, a beach in China where you've got about half seagrass and half plastic. These are floats used in mariculture in China and the scale is truly staggering. I just want you to look and see uh, how big the fjords are where this aquaculture is taking place. This is massive scale uh, of huge numbers of these styrofoam floats releasing these tiny beads of styrofoam into the marine environment in mass. And so it's not just every little bit of plastic that Angela's finding and I'm finding in my nets. It's also these fresh inputs coming in constantly from operations like this oyster uh, farming operation. We're getting our oysters, virtually all of them now, from farm oysters operations like this. And when we think about the equipment that's used, we have to start having some kind of control so that we don't lose so many of these microplastics into the marine environment. That scale is truly staggering. And somehow there's got to be some responsibility for the equipment. Because why? We're seeing it in the salps. The salps are the vacuum cleaners of the ocean. These are the little chordate jellies that actually have a primitive backbone that pulse water. All they're doing, most of the feeding that goes on in the ocean isn't like what we think about eating, where we see the food, we taste the food, we grab the food. This is not like a fish feeding or a bird feeding. Most of the feeding going on in the ocean is just bumping into stuff. The ocean is so depauperate, there's so much distance between pieces of food in the ocean that, you know, that jellyfish you see going like this, that's not to swim, that's just to pump a whole bunch of water so it can get a few little bits of food out of that water and eat it. These salps are capable of processing half the water column they inhabit every day, pumping all this water, pumping all this water. All these microplastics, they don't know the difference between plastic and plankton. They're just being consuming it. Anything that will fit in that orifice, they're hollow at both ends. Anything that will fit in there is going in. And it gets stuck and it becomes part of the system. That's why I think a lot of this microplastic that we don't see in our samples is going into these creatures. And we don't see it on any of these diagrams. This is a diagram purporting to show who's eating who in the ocean. The little guy eats the big guy and on up the chain. My position is all right, I've seen enough. Every single trophic level in the ocean is eating plastic. It's got to be put into the diagram, but it's very hard for guys doing stuff like the census of marine life uh, to accept the fact that a non-living organism is food at every level and a non-living organism is a predator at every level. Not only is it food at every level, it's killing stuff at every level. It's making it so they can't swim. It's tangling up the whales. It's tangling up the turtles. It's tangling up the plankton. I've got pictures of jellyfish caught in these nets. So when we say we want science to drive policy, let's realize that science takes a long time to catch up with the bummers that are affecting us every day. And here, you know, those of you who are beachcombers, a lot of times these are your... Uh, another chair failure, it looks like. Uh, the uh, um, indicator for when you're going to have a lot of good glass ball hunting is when the Valella Valella come in and come up on the beach. They're the by-the-wind sailors. And when the wind
happens just right and it pushes these pelagic jellyfish on shore, that means you're probably going to find more trash. Well, guess what? When these guys are out in the ocean uh, sailing around, they're bumping into plastic. The plastic's floating on the surface. They're, that that sail is over a jelly-like deck, okay? So the deck of the Valella Valella is just jelly. And when it bumps into a piece of plastic, it treats it like a grain of sand in a pearl oyster. It's an irritant. It starts growing tissue over it. It makes it part of its body. So here's something where it's not even feeding. It's just very passively sailing around the ocean, being turned into a plastic jellyfish by our trash. We're actually plasticizing the creatures of the ocean uh, involuntarily. So let's talk about this tsunami debris that's headed our way. Uh, you're going to be seeing it uh, sooner rather than later, but more and more of it. <clears throat> but really, only 95% of it is going to, I mean, only 5% of it's likely to reach any kind of land at all. 95% of it's going to get caught in the gyre. I mean, uh, look at it uh, in a uh, uh, diagram by Jim Ingram from Camino Island up in Washington. He's a modeler, spent his life modeling these surface ocean currents, seeing where things would go. And this is uh, a picture of the uh, debris from Japan, where it's going to end up. And you can see most all of it is going to be in that convergent zone in the center there. There's a few of them going to hit you guys up here. And you can see them kind of, there's an area there sort of on the border between Washington and Oregon where a lot of stuff is hidden. But um, in general, what you've got is most of this stuff in the eastern and western garbage patch and in the convergence zone between the two garbage patches. So we're seeing things that stick up above. The current drags the stuff and the wind blows the stuff. So the current dragging the stuff is only dragging it at about 10 miles a day. But the wind blowing stuff can blow it a lot faster. It's like sailing. So the first stuff we're seeing is stuff that's got some windage, that's sticking up above the water, that can skid over the top of the water or act like a sailboat. So this boat showed up off Vancouver, uh, actually off the Oregon coast, April 2012. This uh, motorcycle, Harley Davidson, came because it was in its garage. The guy had built a wood garage for his motorcycle, and the whole garage got swept away in the tidal wave. And the garage with the motorcycle came to Graham Island up in BC, and, and the guy found it inside the garage. Kind of rusty, but still <laughs> restorable. So Harley agreed to restore it and uh, repatriate it to the guy because he lost three of his family members in the tsunami. Uh, no one, this is a fantasy of a scientist that if you had a blockade, a good place to do it would be off Curie Atoll and right here off. Uh, Washington and Oregon coast, but it's a fantasy because no one can go out there and do this. No one can go out there and blockade an area in the ocean for trash. Uh, no one even uh, considered doing that. Uh, here's uh, the uh, year by year location of the major area that's predicted to have the trash from the tsunami. Year one, it's off of Hawaii. Year two, it's uh, past Hawaii, heading to the coast. Year three, it's by the coast, but it gets caught in the California current sweeping down, so a lot of it's not going to touch. Now, year four, it starts to come back out, and year five, it's hanging out in that eastern garbage pass. That's where it's going to be. We don't have enough data to know if it's going to double what's already out there, triple it, half as much again. We don't really know enough about this system to know how much is out there and how much this is going to add to it. But that's one of the things we're studying in our voyage right now, which is aboard the Sea Dragon. I'm going to be, when I leave here, I'm going to Japan to meet this boat coming in and then send it back out to go to that place where we think the trash is and uh, sample it, find out how much is out there, where it's going, what it's doing, and you know, just see what all they can find out about the uh, tsunami debris front that's out there. Well, um, I'm going to switch gears now and talk about how we got to a point where, uh, <clears throat> where the ocean has filled up with our sins, our waste, our pollution, and has now begun the process of purging itself. All right? 
uh, we're at that point now where we don't even get to decide what nature is going to do. We, we, we were in a position to kind of control it, but now we're in the position of where it, it's just happening. We just got global weirding and, you know, climate is weird. Uh, it's the hottest day in memory down on Cape Blanco Beach. Uh, Angela goes down there all the time, always. She wore me long pants, jacket, hat. I mean, we had to undress when we got down there. Uh, there was a, it was a very warm day down there. These planetary systems uh, that we've been engaging with are now beginning to engage with us in ways that we don't predict. And one of the ways we got here with trash was the idea that we wanted to keep the factories going after World War II that had been converted to making war material to make throwaways. The individual serving. Everything just for you. Have it your way. It's a different world. Not a century ago, less than a century ago. Three quarters of a century ago, we lived in a different world. The Great Depression, World War II, you walked into the post office, you've seen a poster like this, grow and sh raise and share food, walk and carry packages, conserve everything you have. This is a whole different way of life than the life we have today. We don't think about raising and sharing food, walking and carrying packages and conserving everything we have. We think about getting the latest, greatest, next thing, being the first one to get the new thing. Uh, that's a whole different concept. And it had to be taught to us because we come out of the Great Depression and World War II with a conservation ethic. You walked into the theater in 1940, you'd have seen a trailer that said how many razor blades it would take to make a gas tank for a bomber. This is how many steel razor blades you would have to save and turn in to be able to create a gas tank for a bomber. This was like part of your consciousness, conserving everything you have. Now we don't think like that. We think about liberation through waste, freedom through waste. The theory of this article was that the housewife would be more efficient if she didn't have to spend time washing and putting away the dishes. Waste saves time. And now it's part of our consciousness. We can throw that stuff out the window and move on. We don't have to look for a trash can. Disposables burst on the scene in the 50s. Go for convenience. Use once and toss. Why feel guilty? And the first throwaways were paper and aluminum. I know you guys remember the TV dinner and the TV tray that tasted like aluminum foil. You know, the chicken was fried and the peas. And uh, But it was new and it was modern. You had a special tray that you folded out and put your TV dinner on. You could watch TV. Well, that whole concept had to be taught to us. This consumerism was a way to keep production at a high level and it didn't matter what you just needed to buy where have we heard this we heard this from Bush we heard this from after 9-11 we heard from Obama and the recession just get out there folks and buy you want to be a good American you're gonna to have to go into debt you're gonna to have to spend that money you're gonna to have to buy it. well this is President Eisenhower when the first recession after the war came the reporter said president what should people do to make the recession recede? And Eisenhower said, buy. And this was, not a, this was not a standard reply at the time, so the reporter was a little, you know, puzzled. I mean, buy, buy what? I mean, uh, what do you mean, buy? And he says, anything. Just get out there and buy anything. This is how, what you've got to do. This is what you've got to do. Well, there's consequences to this consumer lifestyle. It's not as if it comes with no uh, side effects, all right? And I'm just going to, this is Dexter Masters, Director of Consumers Union in 1960, all right? 52 years ago, half a century ago, he told us what this would lead to. So when design is tied to sales rather than product function, as it is increasingly, and when marketing strategy is based on frequent style changes, there are certain almost inevitable results. A tendency to the use of inferior materials, shortcuts in the time necessary for sound product development, and a neglect of quality and adequate inspection. The effect of such built-in obsolescence is a disguised price increase to the consumer in the form of shorter product life 
and often heavier repair bills. Well, now we just have shorter product life. It's like uh, uh, Gabor Mate said in uh, his book, uh, the only people he found that could repair a toaster was meth addicts up in Canada. You know? uh, uh, we're not getting a lot of repairs done on a lot of smaller appliances. We're just tossing them and getting a new one. Uh, so given that fact, planned obsolescence is like you're having to pay more. I'm going to go one step farther and say it's enforcing poverty on you. You're never going to get ahead because that thing's going to break and you're going to have to get another one and you're going to have to keep buying more and more and more and more and going into debt. That's like enforced poverty. We need quality products that last, that produce the food, clothing, and energy uh, and shelter that we need that we don't have to replace constantly. Now, plastics recycling you'd think would be simple, like glass, steel, aluminum, but it's not, and I think it has a lot to do with the melting point of the plastic. If you've got something that melts at the boiling point of water, you're not going to purify it in the remelting process. Any food, any labeling, any contaminant that's stuck to your glass bottle, your steel can, your aluminum can, you heat that up 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, that's vaporized, that's gone. There's no law against filling a glass bottle that's made out of recycled glass with anything you want and selling it for food. But there is a law against selling food contact on recycled plastic. You can't make a milk bottle out of an old milk bottle and fill it with milk and sell it because the milk fat is not driven off. The contaminants aren't driven off. There's even some nurseries that won't take planting pots made out of recycled plastic because the bacteria haven't been killed in them and they have plant pathogens in there. So you don't purify plastics. It's illegal to make a milk bottle out of an old milk bottle so if you have to do want to be green and have a recycled milk bottle, you've got to have an extra step of coating the inside of that bottle with virgin plastic. That makes it economically unfeasible. So we end up recycling what I call diddly point squat. Uh, that's how much plastic we're recycling. That's the yellow down here. You know, we're just not keeping up with the amount that we're making. It's too hard to recycle. So where does it end up? It ends up in the environment. This is the developing world not being warned that, hey, it's not like a banana leaf. It's not going away. It's not like a wicker basket. It's not going to biodegrade. These plastics are going to stay with you for uh, many generations as you can imagine. This is a stream. Where's the water in the stream? It's going to a river. Here's the river. You know, <clears throat> and if uh, recycling was the answer, these guys would be picking all this stuff up. The only thing that has an economic market is the thin plastic films. So they're just recycling that much. Here's that beach where it's not from the people of Hawaii. This is where my necklace is from. All that stuff washed up from the Pacific Rim. It's None of that virtually is from Hawaii itself. It's where they got logs from here. This is, where, this is a collector beach, Camilo Beach, where ancient Hawaiians went to get logs that could work with a stone adze, soft wood, better than their koa hardwood. They could make their war canoes out of it. Uh, make big canoes. Now what you're more likely to find there is Tonka trucks and uh, Coca-Cola crates. This is our president's favorite beach. This is where he goes when he vacations in Hawaii. Kailua Beach, I've been there. It's got the same problem as Angela has here at Cape Blanco as I find in beaches around the world. Plastic fragments are turning the beaches from natural sand made from coral and shells and rocks to plastic sand made from our trash. You're throwing your beach towel out on plastic. This is uh, one morning's cleanup on the golf course, right around the corner from where the stays. If he went golfing at a public course, that's where he would golf. There's 410 golf balls there spelling out the word trash. And I got them just from a little crevasse right up there where that first wave is breaking in the background, uh, diving out there. See the uh, beautiful headgear that Cynthia Vanderlip and her daughter are wearing there? Uh, there's another thing where we thought we knew what they were. They thought they were hagfish traps, a jawless fish that lives in the deep ocean. But the Korean documentary folks gave us a better clue. And by the way, uh, that pile right here on the corner, that is those cones. Well, here's what they're used for. Watch this guy. 
he's going to show you where these uh, traps are actually used. And it's uh, near that beach where it had all those uh, plastic floats in it, obviously, too. But he picked one of those up, and it's, it, it, it's got a bunch of little plastic fingers that uh, come to a point. And, yeah, you, I'm sure you can demo it. But th this guy does a real good job of demoing it. And then you got this container that goes over the top of it and uh, has the bait in. And it's the eel fishery. It's the eel fishery uh, in the Western Pacific that is using these traps. And they are the most common debris item found on the beaches in Hawaii, are these uh, traps. And they're going to show you how they use them. they got a little cartoon here. They show the um, boat... Uh, dropping the uh, traps down on a line and then it shows the eels uh, swimming into the traps and then I'm retrieving them and losing a certain percentage which then end up floating so uh, there's a line of traps and there's the eels swimming into them so this is again a fishery that doesn't have any uh, incentive not to lose its equipment. It's cheap equipment. It's even in the era I just uh, at Angela's cabin, which is nice enough to let me stay at, she's got a book by Mr. Wood about Japanese fishing floats from the 1970s when all that you found out on the beach was glass floats. And he makes the statement that 50% of the glass floats are lost to uh, the sea in the fishery. Uh, now, I, I don't know if we're any better or worse now, but 50% of the gear being lost is a lot of gear. It's a lot of gear given the fishing effort that's out there. And this is the consequence. This is Cape Blanco, Oregon. And this is the plastic confetti, the plastic soup that is washed ashore there. This is the new sand. And these are the bottles that we see coming over. Chinese bottles. We picked up one from the uh, Olympics in Beijing today. Uh, went out there and got one. So if plastic is coming from all over, it's coming from Asia, it's coming from North America, it's coming from South America, Southeast Asia, Australia. <coughs> Let's look. <coughs> it's coming from the entire coastline of the world. This is a model. of things emanating from the coastlines of the world where they will end up in the world ocean. This is a model based on actual drifters that uh, were deployed by scientists to see where things would go and uh, you can see these garbage patches forming. Uh, you can see the colors, uh, the brighter greens and then the reds are the places where the highest concentration of debris. So, the you remember I said you know, hot air rises at the equator and cold air rushing in pushes it north and south. Well, that same sort of pushing away is happening at the, pole, uh, at the equator. You see how the, the equatorial zone is relatively free all the way around the world from the plastic trash. And it's concentrated in these subtropical areas that are equivalent to where the terrestrial deserts are, the Mojave Desert. Uh, you can see that uh, the desert of Patagonia, the Sahara Desert, all these deserts are sort of corresponding to where these uh, concentration zones are. If you let this go to completion, uh, it turns into this. These are the five garbage patches. We've now been to all five of them. All five of them are polluted uh, with plastic trash. One of the reasons we don't see a lot being done there is if you take a quick look uh, where they are, they're outside the exclusive economic zone of any country. They're not where anybody owns the problem. So if no one's owning the problem, it's very difficult to get any solution to it. These garbage patches are out in the middle of nowhere. And we've been to all of them. We've seen the plastic in all five of them. North and South Pacific, North and South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> you know, when I look at that girl's eyes, I see her saying to the camera, this food container had food in it that was more valuable than I could even afford to buy. This was a really important delivery system for a really valuable food item. It should have another life. It should have 
a place it can go. I can't imagine why someone would take something that was capable of delivering food more expensive than I can afford to buy and making it part of this ugly mess in front of my house here. You know, resource recovery is a natural human trait. Our ancient ancestors carved smaller arrowheads when they broke an arrowhead. You know, it's, this is the first age in which the material that defines the age, we're in the plastic age, this is the first age in which the material that defines the age is not reused. We don't reuse plastic in any meaningful sense. So we want to, but we end up, you know, having, wasting our time doing this stuff. The city of Berkeley even decided not to pick up plastic because they evaluated where it was go and they determined it was a waste wasn't going anywhere. You've got to bundle it up, it's got to be clean, then you've got to put it in an auction block. If no one's in the business of buying that plastic, it's just got to be sent to the landfill. You go to a lot of trouble to separate the plastics that then end up being incinerated or landfilled. Uh, so we get this pretend to recycle thing going on. We get lies because there's no one's enforcing the standards. There is biodegradable plastics. There are standards for what is biodegradable, but no authority is prosecuting people for lying about the label. There's people stamping biodegradable. This is a bag stamped biodegradable that is totally unbiodegradable. The city of San Diego did a test of everything they could find stamped biodegradable. Over 50% showed no change in the city's compost pile. So we don't get the problem. Then, and we don't enforce then we give up. This is waste away enterprises. They're saying, forget this recycling stuff. Don't separate. Too much trouble. Give us your plastic and your garbage all together, mixed together. We'll grind it up. We'll take a magnet and get the metal out. Then we'll put high pressure steam on it, sterilize it. We'll make a product called fluff. Guess what? There's enough nutrients in fluff so that if you put it in an agricultural testing situation, the more fluff you add, the better, bigger plants you get. So right here, you know, 64 parts of fluff gives you the maximum plant growth. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> my co-author, Cassandra Phillips, in this book called Plastic Ocean, is an orchid grower, okay? <clears throat> she got a grant from the USDA to test different kinds of plastics as an or orchid growth medium. It turned out very different results from different plastics. Milk bottles was the one on the left, the control is in the middle, and the polyurethane foam cushion is the one on the right. Okay? Bioactive. This stuff is bioactive. Plastics do things to biology, even to plants. So you take this fluff from Waste Away Enterprises, you're putting all this bioactive plastic into the soil. You're changing the soil completely. So, it's been said that in biology, nothing makes sense without reference to evolution. My quote is, in pollution, nothing makes sense without reference to economics. We pollute because it's economical to pollute. That's why we pollute. The economic paradigm that creates this pollution, this throwaway society, is responsible for this problem. It leaves a big mess and it's unworthy of globalization. It makes it hard to recover the wasted resources. It makes the necessity of growth in production and sale of any old junk, as Eisenhower said, just buy anything. It makes it into a can't get elected on a steady state, no growth platform. A politician can never mouth that and expect to be elected. But uh, it's what we need to do because right now what we're doing is we're just packaging up all our productive capacity, taking it to the cheapest labor market, wrapping the stuff in plastic, sticking it on a boat and sending it back. Uh, so we've got to correct this, but the correction is not going to be the iPad 12 that's going to clean up the ocean and drive you to the airport and cook breakfast for you. It's going to be a political correction. We're going to have to fight the power to get this done. It involves a political reversal. So plastic needs a time out. You know, we've gave it access to our age. It is on us. We're in it. We all our food's delivered in it. We sit in it. We drive in it. We wear it. We haven't got the tools to figure out where it goes. Who in here has had a class in polymer chemistry? Who in here has studied plastics in school? We got one. 
I get one in a hundred too. Yeah, one or two percent of the population has any kind of a concept of what plastic can do or what it should do. We need to take charge of our civilization ourselves and decide where plastic belongs. What's in this bubble wrap? What's this yellow plastic fiber cap? I mean, what are these kids getting by swimming in this river like this full of plastic? Uh, the old concept is that toxins work by overwhelming your body's defenses. Now we work by hijacking control of gene expression. The old way is only high levels matter. Now we think new impacts at everyday levels, levels people have become accustomed to calling normal background levels, they're active. So it's not the old law of Paracelsus that the dose makes the poison, it's the timing that makes the poison. If you're pregnant, if you've got a developing baby, a vanishingly small dose of these plastic endocrine disruptors, one part per trillion, like one drop in 60 tank cars, much less than a drop in one swimming pool, can affect the development. So timing is crucial. Timing is crucial and it even transmits to the next generation. It changes evolution. We're getting this stuff in our canned food. You can't buy organic peas at Whole Foods and not get bisphenol A. The lining that keeps that can from rusting is epoxy that leaches bisphenol A into the compound. The kids at Harvard were given canned soup for a week. Their bisphenol A skyrocketed. They took the canned soup away. They came back down. It's well known that bisphenol A causes endocrine disruption. It causes type 2 diabetes, hyperinsulinemia. You take two rats, feed one uh, compound similar to bisphenol A, leave the other one same diet and exercise, one gets twice as big. So when Michelle Obama says, let's move, let's get French fries and Cokes out of the cafeteria and let's exercise, two parts of a three-factor equation. The third factor in that equation is this body burden of chemicals unknown before 1950 that's in all of us. You have your serum uh, tested, you're going to have 150 chemicals in there that didn't exist before 1950 that no one knows how that's affecting your endocrine system, your body's response to stimuli. One of the ways is diabetes and obesity. So Dr. Von Saul says we have to take into account the exponential increase in man-made chemicals over the last two decades when we evaluate why we're having this global epidemic of diabetes and obesity. Phthalates, these plasticizers, they're in everything. They're in your, I mean, women are exposed. I mean, you, if you walk into a beauty salon, folks, don't you smell it. I mean, that stuff's not good for you. It's not. It's not. It's the new car smells not good. <laughs> Sexy for her, but for baby, it could really be poison. All these cosmetics. <clears throat> DEHP, diethyl hexyl phthalate, and premature puberty in Puerto Rican girls. Premature. Women are becoming, children are becoming women at younger and younger ages. This is a known fact. Talarchy, which is the onset of Breast development and menstruation is happening at younger and younger ages. There's no question but what this is, the body burden of estrogen-like chemicals in the plastics and other compounds in our everyday lives. We can't just wear pink and march and give money to the American Cancer Society if we're going to cure breast cancer. We're going to have to give plastic a time out. Low, and the, the other side of it, guys, is that if it's making women out of girls, it's retarding your development as a man. It's anti-androgen, low testosterone, hypospadias, inhibition of normal scrotal development, undescended <coughs> testes, testicular tumors. These are the blood levels that correlated with human effects, low testosterone in newborn males, low sperm count in adulthood, premature birth, obesity. This is cryptorchidism, failure of testicular descent. This is what it actually looked like. You have a little tiny penis and the, the scrotum doesn't descend with the testicles in it and the hypospadia means that instead of the urine coming out of the tip of the penis, there's a little slot on the side of the penis that the urine comes out. This is what's happening. It's been banned already. We're starting to be the dumping ground for a lot of these chemicals. Other countries are banning them. We're still letting it happen. We're, we're, 
uh, in the grips of an economic juggernaut that's out of our control. We're, we're really uh, becoming, uh, I guess the uh, way you'd say it is uh, Americans are making sheep look like revolutionaries. Uh, <laughs> Alternatives are readily available, folks. Children are sensitive to these things. So what are we going to do? How are we going to make decisions? You're not going to find this in Consumer Reports, how to evaluate these two million brands that are buying for attention. We've got this tremendous onslaught of new, 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 and it's not making us happier. It's not making us healthier. It's not making us richer. It's not making us better. So I think we've got to withdraw from this. And the only way we can do it, we can't, like I say, no politician can get elected on a platform of, you know, slowing growth, slowing production, getting rid of crap. Uh, that's not uh, a winning a political uh, philosophy. So we're just going to have to back off from the system that won't let us win and do our own thing. And that's why small communities are the key. Because you can have a regional reliance inventory. You can find out who among you is creating things that you need for your food, your shelter, your clothing, and your energy. You can fund a kid that's got a good idea. If a, you can have a local stock exchange, the kid, all the 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 Securities and Exchange Commission is there for is to make sure that you're apprised of the risk before you invent invest in a security. If that kid can get up there and tell you what the risks are for investing in his great idea, and you listen to him and you think he's done a good job evaluating the risk and you want to go forward and invest in this kid, you should be able to have a local stock exchange where you can do that and make that work. And Trex Profit, where I lectured at Franklin and Marshall, is doing that. He's getting communities around the country to create their own local stock exchange outside of the SEC and actually getting the states to sign off on it. So the other th key is interdisciplinary education, education towards exchangeability of functions. Everybody's got EDD, ADD these days. You, you know, you're constantly just looking at your phone. I mean, you know, how are you going to expect to have one job for your entire life? I mean, you might as well accept that and educate folks so that they can change between jobs, be a politician for a while, then engineer the solution, then uh, market it, and then you know, get into agriculture and and make the raw materials. You know, whatever it is. You should be able to move around, do these different jobs, see the different functions, make it all happen. These are the keys to change. The trickle-down that really works is trickle-down technology. We, we can get enough equipment and technical know-how to be independent of these. They're called the, the job creators. They're really the job controllers. They're the shipping the jobs overseas, making the big bucks for themselves. Well, we're the job creators. That's you and me. We're, we're the job creators. We can divest our local economies from the global technical industrial marketing juggernaut that's plundering and polluting and plasticizing the planet and even space and bring the jobs home. Prevention is the key. We used to just say, get it to the market, we'll clean it up, we'll create a super fund, we'll clean it up later. We can't do that with plastic in the ocean. We can't go clean it up, we can't go in outer space, get the and the chlorofluorocarbons out of outer space. Spend more time on prevention. We've got to slow the mother down. Changing needs. This is thoughtful consumption. Think, you know, impulse buying is, is what you're asked to do to be a good citizen. You've got to do the opposite. It's a whole turning the thought process on its head. There's a lot of that going to be happening. Rethinking, thoughtful consumption, changing satisfaction, quality, not quantity, autonomy, being for yourself. That's what all this makeup is, is being for others. That doesn't make you feel better. It makes you think you feel better because other people think you look better. This is not the way to be free, folks. Being for yourself is not being for others. So what I've done is, you know, it was been really slow. I didn't have much chance to go to sea. I was more like with domestic animals and plants because there wasn't a lot of funding out there. So I decided to take a little piece of land I had, turn it into a, a local farm. I work with a CSA. I collected the, the runoff. You know, we have so much nutrients running off into the ocean that we get these algal blooms. <clears throat> I collected this extra algae from an area near a golf course in my lagoon where I learned how to swim as a kid, put it on my farm. The algae is good uh, nutrients for the soil, seaweed, kelp. I tilled it in, 
I uh, use soil blocks, so I don't use any plastic pots. I just make peat and compost and soil and nutrients together and take a, a mold and, and make a block out of it. And uh, it holds together great. You can plant in it. And then you don't get this transplant shock. You know, when you take a plant out of a plastic pot, you got all those roots circling around the plastic. Those are the feeder roots. When you stick it in, you get transplant shock. These uh, soil blocks, they sense that there's air out there and the roots come out and stop. They don't grow. So immediately, as soon as you harvest one crop, you put in another one. I was getting like 150, 200 bucks out of 2,000 square feet. I had the cheapest farm labor you could get anywhere on the block. <laughs> and uh, we had a rigid quality control program where we inspected everything going out for plastic. And there's our uh, quality and control inspector checking out the plastic there. And we used uh, wooden boxes to deliver it, no plastic wrapping the, the produce. And then Aaliyah would distribute it. She's the CSA person that has a route with 100 customers and uh, takes it out of our box and puts it in her box and gets it out there. So uh, we've got to answer these questions before we let plastic into our lives. What types of plastic for what types of jobs? What types of additive ingredients are appropriate? How can labels be made to give useful and complete information? You've got to say what's in the bottle, not just what is inside the bottle, but what's in the bottle itself. That's part of the labeling. We've got to have that. What plastic should biodegrade? What plastic can best be recycled? How can plastic recycling infrastructure be created? You know, we've got to have the tools to do it, and we've got to design for that infrastructure. And who should be responsible for all this plastic sorting and collection? The municipalities are oh, We've got to make it economical to sort and recycle plastic. So our uh, foundation, Algolita, brought 112 kids from 10 nations around the world who had the best ideas for how to implement plastic reduction strategies in their countries. And uh, they, it was amazing uh, what they were able to accomplish. So let the kids figure it out. They know we're leaving them up stacked deck, you know, a big mess to clean up. They know it, and they know it's going to be a problem for them, so they want to deal with it. They, they, you can't tell a kid that they can't figure out how to solve the problem, so let them do it. And uh, read my book, Plastic Ocean. We'll be signing them after the lecture. And uh, our group now has become international. The, this message is reaching out as the ocean washes ashore what it will no longer tolerate. People are seeing it. They're seeing it in their communities. They're seeing it in their animals. I just read a paper from Iran. Scientists in Iran went to the place where they butcher the goats and found a fourth of them with plastic in their stomachs. These are scientists in Iran freaking out because their goats and their sheep are eating plastic. We need new board members. Any, I've got cards from our president, Bill uh, Francis here, if you'd like to be one of our board members or work with us at Algolita, he'd like to hear from you. So we think it's a viable concept, this plastic footprint. Start thinking about your plastic footprint. Uh, it's going to be part of the discussion. And uh, this is our legacy. You can take away the question mark, but with your help, uh, we're going to turn this around, uh, especially with Angela's help. So thank you very much. <laughs>